Good afternoon, LBC Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and I am with the Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest. But at first, I have some merchandise on sale. We have stickers with the logo, and we have hoodies with the logo on the front. And the first 50 guests on the back include Mr. Joe Segan. Joe Segan has been making music since childhood, growing up as the son of a music educator in Pennsylvania's Wyoming Valley. Valley. Uh, now living in Lancaster, he continues to perform as a solo act and also with his band, The Benders, appearing regu- regularly throughout Northeast, Southeast, and Central PA. Waves, his first full-length recording of an all-original material, came out in, the, in 2018, followed by his five-song EP, Flair, released in April of 2020. Joe released the song Good Times Never Last in April of 2022, which was co-written with his producer and longtime collabor- collaborator, Brett Alexander of the Badleys. Joe Segan has also recorded with Joe Tosolt, uh, Tosolt uh, pr- playing guitar on Tosolt's 2010 solo album, Captain Bob's Guitar, as well as Gone Wrong Songs in 2021, Let's Say You Knew 2013, and Come Back to Me in 2014 with JT and Blue Mountain Stone. You can also hear Joe on the track of Fear of Falling, recorded at the Maltrunk Opera House in Jim, in Jim Thorpe with Brett Alexander and Nick Van Wick, which is also available on their 2017 album Live. Joe graduated from Tulane Law School in New Orleans with a certificate of specialization in environmental law. Joe has been practicing law for 28 years and is currently the director of General Law Division of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. You can find Joe at his website, joesegan.com. That's J-O-E-C-I-G-A-N.com. You can also find him on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, and all other places. Joe, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So what got you started in music? What, you said your, uh, your dad owned a music sto- store. My dad owned a music store with his late partner, and he was also a music educator. And he taught both high school band, marching band, uh, elementary school students throughout his career. And so I was exposed uh, to quite a bit of music. You know, I would go uh, to all the games and see the the band march and and watch rehearsals. And I would go uh, with the high school marching band's class trips to New York City to see shows on Broadway, which for a series of years was Beatlemania every year because everybody was a Beatles fan. And that that made quite an impression. But yeah, I've always been interested in music. Did you ever join the marching band? Um, The high school I attended uh, did not have a marching band. Mm -hmm. We had a a pep band that played in the stands. And yes, I... uh, I joined that band, and also I would, you know, much to the director's uh, frustration, I would come up with some own arrangements, pass them out, and we would <laughs> play <laughs> when we wanted, regardless. Of what. That's awesome. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, what instrument did you play? I played trumpet. Trumpet. Well, you know, I was interested in joining the band because uh, a friend of mine, close friend of mine, was an upperclassman. And uh, I mentioned it to my dad and I did start on drums and I thought about drums and he said, well, what instrument are you interested in? And I said, well, maybe brass. And he had a trumpet around the house and he gave me uh, a couple lessons on the spot and I tried out the following day and, you know, got into the band. I mean, the bar was fairly low, right? but uh, sure. it, w- it was a, a lot of fun and I made some really good friends. Yeah, trumpet is one of those instruments. I tried playing a trumpet. Uh, I took brass lab this past year, and oh my gosh, do you have to be particular with your placement? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the embouchure you is develop your embouchure. Yes. Oh my gosh, I. I've, it was uh, I. They first started me on French horn, which is even worse. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's uh, yeah. You really need precision. Yes. To play that instrument. Yes. So tr- from going from French horn to trumpet, I was like, oh, thank God, I can actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, my favorite had to be the tuba because you could just do whatever you want and a sound would come out. Yeah, I really fell in love with the tuba when I was living in New Orleans. There yeah. was the uh, Rebirth Brass Band. I was a big fan and still am a big fan. Um, uh, Kermit Ruffins was leading them at the time. He's now a solo artist. I follow him there too. But I'd try to get to the Maple Leaf every Tuesday when I was living down there for, for the Rebirth. But that was in the early 90s. That was quite some time ago. Yeah. 
So, uh, so you started out, your first instrument was drums, you said. I started out on drums. Um, I, in my dad's music store, my father always supported my interests in music, and I took lessons from a, from a wonderful, wonderful person, Jimmy Musto. He played in a very popular country band in Northeast Pennsylvania called Abilene, and he was, a, he was an excellent teacher, and I, at the time, I was a, an awful student, <laughs> and I... And, and unfortunately put him through his paces. Uh, but I did reform <laughs> when I hit my teen years and was uh, uh, very interested in uh, learning and, and getting better. So w- were your lessons just of uh, your dad made me, made me do it or was... Oh, well, my, my dad never really encouraged me um, to pursue music. Um, and, and, and he was... Uh, there was a time when I was interested in pursuing a career in music and, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he discouraged that just, and I think it had a lot to do with, um, working in the music store. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think he really liked to have the music store cause it was an opportunity for him to socialize with folks. My dad's a very social person, loves conversation, loves people. And, um, uh, a lot of the teachers and he, 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 he he did some wonderful things for his teachers. He, yeah, I mean, he they, they, it was a nice nice community there. But also, you know, he saw folks that you know couldn't afford to have health insurance mm. and the problems associated with that, and the you know the the anxiety associated with a a job that's dependent upon gigs. Yes, and we know that you know those are you know accidents happen. People get double booked. Um, weather changes. Uh, you know, so, uh, and when you're relying on, on that income to support a family, it's difficult. So, um, he, he, not only did my father, you know, and my mom support my interest in music and provide instruments and provide lessons. They also encouraged me to, uh, pursue my education too. And so, uh, how long did you stay with music or did you always stay with music into your collegiate career? Well, you know, um, in high school, there was a period where I questioned whether the amount of time and amount of effort I was putting into music uh, was worth it. And maybe I would get more value or bang for my buck if I d- directed my attention elsewhere. So there was about a year and a half that I stopped playing music and not having, I still had music in my life listening to it because I've been a music enthusiast all my life and I love to go to concerts and I love to you know, support my friends who play. Um, but, uh, you know, not having, not developing the craft, not having it in my life made me recognize how valuable it was. Mm. And that that assumption that I was not getting, uh, it, 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 that assumption that it wasn't worth it turned out to be wrong. And, uh, you know, I went back to it with renewed vigor and uh, found uh, had some guidance from some wonderful teachers, uh, very different teachers, you know, who sort of developed their own uh, teaching style and philosophy associated with it. Um, so, and I and I like the, you know, the, the, it's it's meditative, very much so, you know, because you push other aspects of the, the the world sort of away from you, and you concentrate on one thing, and it allows you to sort of center yourself and, you know, calm yourself down and get in touch with uh, your feelings, considering yeah. music conveys feeling and emotion. Yeah, it's uh, the the use of escapism through music is incredible and True. very much valuable because uh, there's so much things that goes on in one's day, whether it be the, the, the small inconvenience to the big earth-shattering uh, stuff that can happen. Yes. Uh, music is... One, one of the most unique ways to filter through that, to escape through that, and to uh, reconcile yourself f- with these events or even just get away from it for a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, music and movies, at least. And it's also an opportunity for expression. For expression, to exactly. To Id- convey ideas and convey feelings. I mean, the one thing, you know, when I was a kid, I thought magic was really cool. <laughs> and I loved sci-fi. And I loved fantasy and those magical aspects. And as I grew, I, you know, there, there was the, the day I realized that, well, magic isn't really real. But the more I studied music and the more I played music, I recognized that magic actually is real. And music is, in, in my experience, the, uh, uh, a very magical thing because, like, 
I could explain to you how I'm feeling, but you won't Understand. know how I'm feeling. Exactly. But if I'm conveying an emotion through music, I think you will have a much better understanding of what my... And, and the idea of sound mm -hmm. um, conveying emotion so effectively, and, and, and especially live music and improvisational music, where you're there watching an artist walk down the path, and they either reach a moment of enlightenment or they come upon a beautiful escape, a, a mistake and you see the joy in the artist and you experience that simultaneously with the artist. I think there's no other artistic medium that has that level right. of magic and allowing, because like the written word, you climb into the mind of the author mm -hmm. and like a painting is a static thing. I mean, it hangs in a room and it can't affect how you know people feel even if they're not act, act, actively engaging with the work. But really, music is the one that you, you're there at that moment right. in time and you share it with the artist. And the music gives context to the word. That's, True. That really convey, helps you convey the emotion, right? Uh, I, th I think you're right. Mov uh, it's movies and music that are the two things that really can encapsulate you. Uh, there are some artists that are really good at doing that, but I, w I might argue that for the most part, art is something you look at. And uh, you can you can understand, but it, it's the feeling that they're feeling isn't well portrayed. I would agree with you there. Right. Yeah. Um, so you so what did you do after that year of hiatus from music? Um, well, during that period, I started studying martial arts. And uh, I continued doing it when I re-engaged with music too. And I, I and after, you know, I, I, I lived in New Orleans for a period of time when I was going to law school, even after I graduated from law school and started uh, practicing law, um, I found my old teacher. And you know how important a good teacher is. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, began studying with him again. I stopped when, uh, when I had my first child just mm -hmm. because of, uh, you know, priorities and time demands. That was one that uh, sort of fell by the wayside. So did you, um, after high school, you, you didn't make, decide to go into music, you decided to go into law. What? Well, I always played music. I mean, right. I, play, I was playing, I've been playing in bands before I went to law school. I mean, I, I, did, I pursued, I mean, it's somewhat interesting because I did want to be an environmental lawyer. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania, between Wilkesbury and Scranton, and both my grandfathers were coal miners. And, you know, listening to their stories as to how um, they were exploited and how difficult their life was in spending most of their time in the mines. And I, you know, I remember as a child um, the impacts from having black lung and that, you know, my grandfather just walking across, my grandfather on my mother's side, just walking across the room was, was, a, was a big effort for him. And I was very disappointed about that, you know, that their lives were shortened, um, you know, uh, because of the work that they did. And also, you know, I was very upset about um, the impacts from mining in right. northeastern Pennsylvania. My, my neighbor uh, at the time, I mean, we grew up together. He's also a, a guitar enthusiast, Nick Darbenzio. Um, part of his yard subsided into the mines. And in, 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 oh, wow. in my own yard, there was a uh, acid mine seep. I mean, at the time, I didn't know what it was. We called it the Orange, the orange Crick, the Orange oh, Creek, but no. in Northeast PA. But actually, it was uh, acid mine drainage. And, you know, like uh, as I learned more about, I mean, I am a conservationist at, at heart. Right. As I learned more about the impacts from mining, all the streams that I would drive by, there was an ice cream place. Um, close to my house that had a stream adjacent to it. And it was crystal clear. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a really beautiful stream. But actually, it wasn't a beautiful stream. It was impacted by acid mine drainage, and nothing could live in it. Right. That's why it was crystal clear. Right. And, um, you know, when I was in seventh grade, uh, my uh, science teacher stopped class to talk about a local event. There was a gentleman, um, Scofflaw, who owned a gas station that had a borehole um the town i grew up in a borehole a bore well the town i grew up in um didn't have sewers um everybody had a borehole and a borehole is was a was a was a hole drilled down to the mines and pretty much everyone's sewage oh. went down into the mines and this gentleman who also had a borehole he let anyone 
who wanted to dump whatever down their borehole. So people were coming off of I-81, which went right by his gas station in, in Pittston Township. And for a couple bucks, they would dump, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, toxic substances and contaminated the mine pool. And it would express itself into the Susquehanna. And still, this went on in the 70s. And that the, the, it, it expresses itself through the Butler Mine Tunnel. And that's still a Superfund site that's still regulated. I mean, this is something that I was made aware of when I'm in seventh grade. And, the, and when the mine pool, when groundwater ra- raises and the mine pool raises, it still discharges um, uh, contaminants. And at the time, you know, I was, I, I, I thought it was very disappointing. And also, too, in the area I grew up in, there were a lot of... Um, calm piles, sort of coal waste piles, just piled up. Most of them are gone now because uh, through cogeneration, um, they were able to burn it and make electricity. Okay. But for the, the majority of my formative years, they were eyesores. And, you know, I was very disappointed that, you know, um, coal companies uh, enjoyed incredible profits on the backs of people like my grandfather and, you know, didn't deal with the impacts uh, from deep coal mining. And, and there were impacts that, you know, I experienced. And, uh, you know, I started to learn about the environmental movement, which really didn't get any traction into the 1970s until after I was born. You know, mm-hmm. I am older than the environmental movement. And, uh, I thought you were going to say that you were older than the EPA. or the EPA. I am EPA. older than the EPA because oh, yeah? that's what Nixon signed. The, he created the EPA. That's, oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I was born in 1969. I'm at the tail end of that. I'm a 60s child. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I wanted to get involved in the field. And I was I pursued Tulane because of its reputation, and I was lucky enough to work with the Environmental Law Clinic when I was at Tulane, and I got to represent, as a student, Audubon Society and Sierra Club and some private re- residents uh, around New Orleans, and you know help prepare briefs and, and and follow matters. It was it was a very exciting time. Well, I'm sure in New Orleans because the city is sinking. So, right. Well, right. Uh, and that was fascinating too. Well, because you know where, where I lived when it rained, I mean they would actively pump. Uh, storm water because it would flood the streets right. and when the pumps got overwhelmed the streets flooded and you know I lived on a camp street for a number of years and uh, when it would rain camp street would flood and it would, and, and sometimes I, I mean I felt horrible sometimes for my neighbors I didn't have a car when I was down there I had a bike and I rode the street car <laughs> that was how I got around town um, but some of my neighbors when the water would get above the you know the floorboards I mean, oh, their wow. cars would get flooded, and it was it was just so sad of them trying to you know get the the funk out of their vehicles and the mold and everything that would follow in the wake of a a, a, a flooding event. But yeah, yeah. And well, when I was down there, uh, Tulane had a wonderful environmental law program. We went out into the salt marshes. Uh, Tulane had a wonderful facility there that was monitoring how um, oil and gas development were uh, accelerating erosion. Um, in Louisiana, how it was losing so much uh, uh, coastland because, oh, wow. you know, the marshes, it was sort of po- pocked and right, like pockets, the, 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 yeah. the, 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 the brackish water wouldn't be able to infiltrate quickly. Right. But when the gas developers would try to get to a location, they would cut through it and facilitate, mm, you know, intrusion movement. of yeah. salt water, which would affect the biology and also accelerate erosion. So that was, uh, you know, it, it was interesting. Uh, it was an interesting time. I mean, I'm glad I went, came back to Pennsylvania because really, you know, I was raised here and I'm, I'm most concerned about the environment here. Um, uh, but, uh, you know. It's, it's interesting. Because um, up in, I'm pretty sure it's up in that area that there's a coal mine that's still burning to this day. Yeah, there's several several mine fires. I know my office. Uh, you know, we we were involved in the contracting to extinguish the the Dolph mine fire in in Lackawanna County, and there's Centralia, which yeah, is the famous the one. one. Yeah, the yes, one. Yeah. and that was where you know everybody was bought out, and it was deemed as the most appropriate means of uh, addressing the situation, as to making sure people were safe, and uh, you know. So yeah, it, I mean it's it, it it is fascinating. Yeah, it's um and at that correct me if I'm wrong, but at that time, couldn't corporations like literally own townships, 
or is that way earlier than, than what I'm thinking? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I mean, you know, I, I guess they could theoretically well, own I, as much land as they want. I know that's a, that's illegal at this point. Um, but it, it used to be that back in the day that they would, they would, corporations would literally set up townships that they would create housing for their employees. And then whenever yes. they moved, moved out, they were just, they, you know, they were forced to leave and forced to remove well, themselves. From interestingly the enough, uh, my grandparents on my mother's side, they actually lived in a company house. Mm. It was built by the company. It was uh, at least two employees. My, my grandfather, who was a carpenter, acquired it and uh, maintained it over the years. Um, it no longer exists, but, uh, you know, it was a, it, it, and, you know, it, 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 but he was a carpenter. That, when I knew it, it was substantially changed, uh, but it was, uh, I was, I was told that it was a company house originally. Yeah. That's, it's, it's wild to me that a, a company could at one point own so much of you that they would even own your house. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so music, right? Yes. Uh, you've always done. When did you go to Tulane? Was it right after high school? or? Uh, well, I, I went to undergrad at Lafayette College in okay. Easton. And um, uh, I, mean, I mean, I first started playing music when I was around nine. And uh, I, was, I joined my first band when I was 14, mm. and when I was a freshman in high school. One of uh, a, a gentleman who was also in my homeroom class realized I was a player and asked me to join his band. His name's Joe Tolsult. And uh, Joe and I ended up going to Lafayette and rushing the same fraternity. And we played in bands. The first, our freshman year, we both played in separate bands. Um, but for our sophomore, junior, and senior years, we were playing uh, together. And uh, that, was a, that was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, when I went, to, I went to law school in 1991, I moved down to New Orleans. And I sort of put the guitar, I still played guitar for fun and, you know, mm -hmm. got together with buddies and, you know, played some songs. Um, and my, my third year, you know, uh, uh, a gentleman approached me who was in my class and asked if I wanted to play some gigs with him. And he was a wonderful drummer and he happened to be the, the, the dean of the law school son. Uh, and I yeah. thought, well, if he could, he could go out and play, I, maybe I could do that too. And, and, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it had, playing with some some really good friends very talented people so when you first started your band were you on guitar primarily yes yes so what was it like to did did you guys go out and do gigs or or was it just like private events we did we did gigs um of course we couldn't play in bars because uh, we were high schoolers um but we would do a lot of school dances not only our own schools but other schools would hire us um really yeah um i remember yeah we did a we did a a, a bunch of uh, uh played a bunch of different school dances how was that received by your peers oh great really oh they were thrilled um there were there were two uh we had i mean we were practicing and learning musicians at the time of course but uh we had two female singers that were older than us and they had incredible voices and they both covered they're very different. Like one was would cover all the Stevie Nicks, Fleetwood Mac, sort of mm. in the pocket stuff. The other one would be the, you know, the over the top gospel. You know, could really well. And they were, uh, they were older than us, and they could drive. And I <laughs> and it was the coolest thing ever because I would have these two women come to my house and pick me up to take me to band practice, and it was, you know, that really uh, was sort of an ego boost. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so at Lafayette, you or when was the first point that you decided to write songs? Well, it's interesting because um, you know about a little bit more, maybe a decade ago or so, uh, I started going out to open mics and playing. Well, you know, after I graduated from law school and moved back to the Northeast, um, one of my dad's guitar instructors was relocating and he was looking for somebody to take over his student base and he asked me if I would do it. And I always loved working with kids. I worked at the Pittston YMCA when I was an adolescent. I worked at the summer camp. I worked the Saturday morning programs. I lifeguarded. I taught swimming lessons um, and, and liked working with children. Um, so, you know, I assumed uh, those students and taught at my dad's music store for I think close to 20 years. I didn't have a, a many um, just a couple, and I tried to, you know, sort of tailor uh, the the lessons to the students. 
um, which was very time consuming oh, to sure. try to come up with original lessons. And I had just like stacks and sometimes I could use lessons with more than one student, but I tried to, you know, tailor the instruction to the students. But then, you know, after so many years, I wanted to focus back on performing. I had a band that like we'd play a bar like once a month, but I wanted to focus more on, 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 on performing. So I started going out to open mics and that's where I met, uh, uh, Eddie Apnell, who was in a band that I followed when I was younger and first able to go to bars. And Brett Alexander, I was a fan of the Badleys and, um, uh, when I first turned 21 and I used to follow them. And um, they were very supportive and they uh, you know, encouraged me. And I was at one of their open mics and Brett said, hey, you know, I just got hired to uh, engineer at a, 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 a studio that's reconstituting I have a bunch of time. I need to go in and shake things down. Do you want to go in and write a song? Hmm. And I said, yeah, I do. And I went over and sat in the corner and thought about it. I went back and Brett, you know, I don't really write songs. He said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll write a song. We'll have a good time. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And, um, and then I went home and that was like a Wednesday evening and the session was Monday. And I started going through my notes and I found lyrics and songs like all these songs that i've I, i've written but never really sort of performed mm -hmm. um and uh so i think i was sort of wrong that i didn't write songs before but for that session you know um just because i did not want to show up unprepared and i did not want to come across as somebody who was not ready for the task I wrote three songs mm. in anticipation and i played them for brett and we recorded one during the, uh, at the session, it was fascinating because I asked Brett to sing it at the time. And, you know, I wrote this song and, you know, did a demo of it at home. And it was sort of a tongue in cheek, uh, Tom Waits, sort of Randy Newman type of tune. And Brett interpreted, interpreted it with uh, a lot of gravitas and a lot of like oh, yeah? deep feeling. And it, and it was sort of fascinating to see you know, the t a tune sort of presented in a different way. And I thought that uh, made a lot of sense. So, you know, I've been working with Brett since. We did a, an album. I did an album in his studio. Part of it was recorded in uh, Paul Smith's studio eight days a week in Northumberland. Paul played bass for the Badleys. And Brett ran those sessions. Paul engineered the sessions. And a uh, beautiful studio. I'd recommend it to anyone. It's an old 70s style studio. Paul has a wonderful collection of... Uh, instruments he has got the, you know the b3 with the uh you know with the leslie speaker and uh he really knows what he's doing because i could uh you know give him examples of what i was looking for and he could he he, he could replicate it so we did a we did a full album um most mostly with the guys from my band in northeastern pennsylvania and uh you know from then i've been doing you know i did a ep after that i wanted to do something live all acoustic um no overdubs you know to, to try to capture that energy and the you know sort of mixing you get that mm -hmm. call and response with a you know a simultaneous performance and i was pretty happy with that and coming out of the pandemic now uh i wrote a song with brett that we recorded and published in april and uh very happy with that tune called good times never last and uh, a couple weeks ago we got together for a writing session and wrote a new song called ghost light and uh, we're in the process of getting ready to publish that one uh, i'm very excited for it yesterday um uh, the cover art was delivered um there was a an artist from west uh, uh reading that i met uh at a high school friend's christmas party who we reconnected when i moved to lancaster and, uh, you know, I was very impressed with her work. I really like it. It really speaks to me. So I reached out to her and asked if she would do cover art. And uh, it, it turned out great. Um, so, you know, I brought her a concept for this new song um, that, you know, connects to the content of the song. And uh, she turned it around really quickly. You know, I'd encourage all my music friends, if, you're, if you need graphic art design, I, please give uh, Bernadette Emerson, uh, 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 consider her work or consider her, uh, hiring her skills because, I mean, she d does really great work and she's uh, uh, very receptive to back and forth. You know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, j just, just to make sure that... Uh, uh, 
you know, I like to give her sort of wide discretion to, to express herself because mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm asking her to do the work because right. I like her work. I exactly. don't want her to do something that's not an expression of hers. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been a good partnership and I hope I, 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 I hope she continues to work with me. That's great. So when did you start, uh, when did you form your first band? Why did you do it? How did you do it? Well, I was asked by Joe Tolsol to join his band, mm. and uh, I'd never been in a rock and roll outfit before, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Joe's brother, uh, Bob, was also in the band as a drummer, and you know I knew Bob very well. He was a very good friend. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just, actually, it was curiosity and learning how to do it. And uh, Joe, is an, he played guitar in that band, but he's an excellent keyboard player. But we had another keyboard player. But we, he would play keys like we used to do a lot of doors. And he had the Ray Manzarek finger bass down. And we used to do Riders on the Storm and L.A. Woman and all the heavy, heavily orchestrated tunes. And that sort of served us well because um, when we played in jam bands in college, we already had a repertoire to uh, pull from. It was a little bit different than what other people were doing. We were able to mix those songs in with, uh, with other tunes, and it was uh, it, it worked out pretty well. So, um, going out of uh, did you you went to law school in Tulane, New Orleans? Uh, did you what was the music there like at that time? Well, uh, funk was king. Yes. Um, you know the meters had reconstituted, um, and that was of course. You know, Art Neville, Papa Funk from the Neville Brothers, George Porter Jr., who's still very active. And I'd recommend anyway, he's one of my, I I guess he is my favorite bass player. (laughs) Um, Leo Nocentelli was in the band still. uh, And uh, Russell Batiste, uh, their original drummer, uh, Zigaboo Joseph, modelist, uh, was uh, not interested in the the scheduling. I did see a couple of reunion shows Mm -hmm. with with Zig that were really wild. And while I was down there, uh, Leo left the meters and moved to L.A. to do session work. And they, they picked up Brian Stoltz, who was originally played with the Neville Brothers. And I'm a really big fan of, uh, of, uh, of Brian's playing. He's a really excellent player. But, you know, I followed, I followed the Neville Brothers. I mean, the meters were my number one. If they were playing in town, I would make every effort to get there to see uh, them. Um, and also, too, I lived within walking distance of uh, Tipitina's, which was my favorite music club, so I'd see a lot of uh, music there. And plus, there were some, you know, regular things. Like, you know, I mentioned the Rebirth Brass Band would play Tuesday nights at the Maple Leaf. And that was, a, you know, a traditional ba- brass band, no amplification, mm-hmm. very uh, loose and fun, you know, that have one person sort of directing, calling out transitions to parts, you know, identifying who the soloists were. So it was very organic and very exciting. Um, and also, too, I was a really big fan of John Mooney. Uh, he's a blues guitar player. Yeah. He uh, he's sort of a the progeny of uh, Sun House, and he toured with Sun in his later years. And you know, as Sun House would, uh, Sun House was a very religious man, and he would do uh, you know a cappella uh, sort of gospel stuff. Uh, John Mooney would do that, and he would be uh, he played a bar uh, on Carrollton Avenue on Sundays, and he'd surround himself with a couple guitars tuned different ways, and he'd play. Every style of blues, just Piedmont and uh, country and uh, Delta and you know Chicago. It was, it was, it was really wonderful because uh, he was a master and and it was just him and it was uh, very very real. So yeah, I really liked uh, and of course Jazz Fest, which I really didn't get to experience until after I graduated because finals uh, oh, I, landed yeah. and, and and law school is very expensive. And your grade relies on just one test, that one final test. There's no oh, like, really? yeah, it's three, your whole grade rel- at Tulane. It was it was one three hour test. What? That's yeah, wild. and it was an open book test too, because you know, because it was that hard. Because if you didn't know the material, well, you know, it's legal analysis. Oh, so right, right. you know, it's you, you're apl- you're applying a logical framework to a given so, scenario. Gotcha. Yes. So um, it's a thought process that. So so really, having the books is necessary right well not really going to help you <laughs> oh okay well fair enough yeah it's not true. like you're yeah. memorizing facts you know they're, gotcha. they're presenting something and they're saying well 
you know, how would you advise or how would you deal with this situation? Or is this person culpable? Or is this, is this an enforceable contract? That, 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 type, that type of stuff. And how would you approach it? And what would be the alternatives? So, you know, but I did go back with a group of friends in 96 and we did the whole Jazz Fest experience and had a hell of a time. Got to see Fats Domino and, uh, you know, a lot of old classic players and Snook Sieglin. Well, I've seen Snooks. Snooks was actually the first artist I saw perform live in New Orleans because I moved down there and I was really involved in orientation and getting situated in, in law school. And I had no family, no friends. I, I moved there cold. I had no connections to the city or the school whatsoever. Um, and uh, one of the uh, sort of orientation people to help you figure out what's what and make you feel comfortable was a music fan that went to Tulane undergrad and was also in the law school. And I, I met him, I ran into him at a, at a, at a mixer and they were called bar reviews. Um, and, and it was because they were held in bars and they were financed by the school's social society and they would pay for all the alcohol and, you know, the law students would get together and, and, and mingle. And this, uh, this person that I met who knew I was a music enthusiast said, Hey, you want to go to Tipitina's after that? Or he said, you want to go to tips after this? And I'm like, what's tips? Tipitina's. And I'm like, what's Tipitina's? He's like, it's a music club. You'll have a good time. And it was that night to see Snook Siegelin. And uh, George Porter was in his band. And it was, uh, it was rather remarkable. It was eye-opening. Because I knew New Orleans was a music town, but I didn't really understand what that was what that meant and yeah. uh you know and and, 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 and learning about Tipitine as being the professor long hair memorial and, and and learning about all the the professors and doctors like dr john and uh and and how that whole oral tradition um developed and was celebrated did you ever get to see paul mccartney uh, yeah i've seen paul, paul mccartney twice i saw him in 2002 and I think it was either 2015, 16, I, I, I got to take my kids okay. to see him in Hershey. And I'm a big Beatles fan. I'm a big Paul fan. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was wondering, because he had just had a concert recently in, in Baltimore. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, that's cool. That's good to see Paul McCartney. I'm, I'm going to kick myself if he doesn't ever tour again. <laughs> well, he's promising to come back. And I would, re I would recommend it because the band he's playing with now, he's been playing with the same players for over two decades. This is his oldest band and oh, most wow. seasoned band. And they're excellent players. And they know the material. And they're multi-instrumentalists so they could switch off instruments because Paul switches between bass, guitar, keys, mandolin, ukulele throughout oh, wow. the show. So they all cover their own ground so I, I i would certainly encourage you to to see him because he puts on a hell of a show <laughs> for sure so when you moved back to or what what made you said you wanted to come back here because you cared about this area more well per se well you know um i would have been happy to go anywhere for the work uh, mm -hmm. but when i was uh working for the law clinic i approached the director and said hey you know um engaged in the job search. I mean, do you have any suggestions for things that I should consider? And he said, you know, you're from Pennsylvania. I would recommend that you look into the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Um, we've had a number of uh, students, you know, get jobs there. And uh, they've told us some very positive things about Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania has been sort of ahead of the curve on environmental regulation compared oh, wow. to other states. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I pursued a, a job with DEP and, uh, you know, uh, I got asked to interview while I was still living in New Orleans. And uh, my interview was scheduled the day after I had tickets to see Pink Floyd in the Superdome. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and, you know, I had this, oh, should I, because I, I had to get up, at like right. five o'clock in the morning and get on a plane, go up to Wilkes-Barre yeah. and, 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 and fly into the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Airport and do the interviews. And I interviewed in the Wilkes-Barre regional office and I drove down to Harrisburg and I interviewed with central office and I drove back to Wilkes-Barre and took a plane back the same day. So it was like, should Jeez. I go to the, the concert? And I thought, well, you know, it's Pink Floyd. I it's should Pink go to the Floyd. concert. Yeah, right. and, exactly. and it was magnificent. And I ended up staying out way later than I should have. But I slept on the plane and I got the job. So all's, all's, all's well, good. it ends well. 
<laughs> that's funny. Um, it's, it, it's interesting because like I, a lot of my friends were Pink Floyd fans. And, you know, after I saw the show, I, I called them and I said, they're coming to Philly. You should you should see them in Philly. And they're like, well, Roger Waters isn't with them. I don't think so. I'm like, trust me. And they went for the first show Friday. And then one of, one of, one of my buddies called me and said, hey, you want to come down Saturday? He went to both shows in a row. And we, we ended up getting uh, some obstructed view tickets and were able to get into the house, which was, which was more than enough. Right. We were delighted. Yeah. Uh, that, that Pink Floyd is Pink Floyd. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And to see them play live in that, that level of, I mean, that, that music is, is it, it comes across well in the stadium. Not all music will fit mm. that venue, uh, but Pink Floyd definitely does. So uh, when you moved back here and you start, you said uh, you moved back here like five years ago? Well, I moved, oh, right. I moved to northeastern Pennsylvania uh, back to uh, where I was raised uh, in the scranton Wilkesbury area, a little borough called DuPont. Mm -hmm. um in 1994 and then i worked in the in the northeast regional office for dep in wilkesbury for you know approximately 23 years oh wow and um as a you know litigation attorney uh defense enforcement um program development uh type of stuff and it was it was a wonderful experience i worked with some very talented people, learned a lot, um, you know, did some really good work um, that, I'm, that I'm very proud of. Um, but then I, 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 I was lucky enough to get the directorship of the General Law Division in Harrisburg, and uh, my boss at the time recommended that I look at Lancaster for, uh, you know, uh, settling down, moving my family. And that was some really good advice because we really enjoy uh, living here. In fact, I actually like living here better than when I was living in New Orleans, to tell you the truth. Oh, wow, yeah. Well, I, well I'd imagine so. Here, the streets don't flood every time. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, well, yeah, but you get the tornado watches and whatnot. There are yeah, pros they're and cons, cons but uh, we're, we're, we're very happy here. And, and it's a very robust music community, yes. obviously. Very much so. And uh, that's one thing I enjoy. And, and one thing that sort of surprised me, I mean, guitar players I found are, are competitive by... Uh, you know, the nature. nature. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you ever hear the joke of how many guitar players does it take to uh, screw in a light bulb? I've never heard that one. Six. One to screw it in, five to stand around watching, going like, hey, I could do it better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, gotcha. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, it, 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 I found in some of the other areas that I lived, like guitar players who are mining the same vein and playing in the same style and competing for the same audience and competing for the same gigs. Um, it, 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 there's not a lot of camaraderie, mm -hmm. let's say, but I found that to be shockingly different here. It like is. I, like the guitar players that I've met that, you know, we share common music interests have become some of my closest friends and collaborators and, and supporters. And, and, uh, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's, it, it's meant a lot to me, you know, in develop, developing those friendships and, you know, enjoying the music we play together, you know? I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and it, I, I keep hearing this repeatedly, 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 that Lancaster is an arts-focused uh, city, whether, whether it be um, theater uh, or gigging, but it's very much the community around here, if, if you take anything away from Lancaster City, is that musicians love each other. Mm -hmm. There's very little... Uh, very little tension, very little uh, com com competition. That's the word uh, around Lancaster in regards to musicians. It's it's really it's really uplifting. If if anything, you're gonna if someone comes up to you, they're gonna be like, "Good job," or they may, they may even give you some point pointers or network you with other people in order to get more involved. It's something that is rarely, if ever, seen elsewhere. That's consistent with my experience. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious, uh, being a, a law practitioner, uh, and you, you also do music. Is that conflict at all? Um. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's amount of prioritization and scheduling right. and, and 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 whatnot. But uh, you know, obviously, uh, when things are busy with my job, that that takes a priority. And you know, right. I I uh. 
I mean, it, it, it's a gig like any other gig. I mean, I know a lot of musicians with day jobs, and th- th- that's my day job. But I, I, I mean, I love being a public servant. Um, I love, I love my work, and I love the people I work with. So um, I, I'm very fortunate in that regard. That's good. Um, so what was it like to uh, come here? Kind of, I guess you ca- came here kind of cold a little bit. Yes, um, it was interesting moving into the community here. Um, but and, and actually, pretty much, I think I met all my friends through music. Hmm. Um, you know, when I first moved down here, I started going out to open mics. And the first one I went to was at Boobies in Mount Joy. That's with B-U-B-E-S. Yes. <laughs> and the pronunciation's on the shirt, just yes. to write. And, and Bjorn was hosting an open mic a Thursday night at the time. And uh, uh, he, as you well know, he hosts a wonderful open mic. He's, you know, that's not, 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 not something everyone could do, making everyone feel welcome and right. sort of guiding the ship because you can't really control it. But he's exceedingly effective at that. Um, and he would, would play on occasion up in northeastern Pennsylvania at a bar I was familiar with called The Rattler, which had a great music scene. Um, at that time, um, and uh, you know, it, it it just went forward from there. So really, I think I made the vast majority of my friends. I can't really think others through music. Yeah, and that just goes to show how open the scene is around here. Because agreed, you you can you can. It's way I've met uh, some people in different towns where. Uh, cities that people are just enemies of each other because they're in the same same similar vein of right. music and it's like that's not not the case here folk bands are, will literally collaborate with each other yeah. uh for the same audience and it's it's not a competition to get gigs because there's every everyone is uh filling in for each other or they're asking hey i can't make this date can you do that date as well it's and it's so much more camaraderie and more uh, uplifting of each other than it is downing each other like yeah. it is in other places. Um, even th- there is still the professionalism of, about it, but behind it, everyone's friends. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, as a music enthusiast, I like living here because I still have access to metropolitan areas oh, absolutely. and the big stage and still there's, you know, there are uh, stadium shows at Hershey park. There are uh, larger arena venues um there are theaters there are clubs Mm -hmm. um you get and and there there, there's the bar scene so um you get the whole spectrum of uh touring musicians and not only that but philadelphia is only an hour away new york city is like three hours away baltimore dc is two hours uh pittsburgh might be a the biggest trek which is four hours or so right but it's all it's all so you get a lot of musicians that uh, maybe they perform there, but they're coming here, coming towards uh, Pittsburgh or going towards D.C. So Lancaster is a spot where a lot of uh, to- musicians will just pop through for a night or so. True. And, you know, I take the train into the city to see shows. Um, that's not, not uncommon. One thing I want to do is go to Ardmore. I talked to other folks who've done that, who've taken the train in to Ardmore, uh, the Ardmore Music Hall. Which has a lot of great music, um, uh, but but yeah yeah the rail access has been a a a, a big bonus. <laughs> so uh, what is it like to you're kind of a solo act now? Well, you know, um, it's uh, sort of hard to say. I'm sort of doing my own thing. I mean, I I was always a guitar player. I was not the singer in most of the bands I was in. But I realized that um, if I wanted to get out and if I wanted to record my own music, I, I was going to need to develop my voice. Mm-hmm. So um, generally, you know, I play, it depends, I play with as many people I could afford. Mm-hmm. You know, if I could afford to hire musicians to play with me, I do, just because it, it makes it more interesting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, if I could do it as a, a gig as a duo, I'll do it as a duo. And there are a number of fellas, wonderful players that I play with, uh, I do duos with, or a trio. And I have my band back home, um, uh, the Benders. Uh, we've been playing together, two of the gentlemen who are in the band, we've been playing together for, oh, geez, almost 30 years. 
Um, and, uh, and we also picked up our, our, our drummer had passed away. Mm. Uh, uh, so we changed the name. We used to be the Hellbenders. It was sort of an environmental thing. You know what a Hellbender is? I do not. It's sort of like a salamander, uh, a large salamander. Not a very pretty uh, creature. It had sort of like a flathead, but they're, they're intolerant to toxins and poor water quality. Oh. And, and they're native to the uh, upper reaches of the Susquehanna, and they were, and they were starting to come back because of um, regulation of what you could discharge to surface waters. And they were sort of a, uh, an indicator of a return like health. of of health, yeah. and uh, we thought that was sort of a good uh, um, symbol for the for the band. Um, but when our our, our drummer uh, Charlie Alimo passed away, he was one of the originals. It did, it just didn't, it didn't feel, feel right. right. Yeah. Uh, and 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 our our our, our, our voc- main primary vocalist and guitar player Dave Gromelski, when they passed away. It just didn't feel right calling it the Hellbenders anymore, just because it couldn't be without them. Right. So we thought the Benders, you'll, you, it, it's not a, it's not a big leap. So you know, folks will still recognize who we are. And we've been playing with a, a wonderful drummer uh, by the name of Bob Kirby, who comes from you know a, a, a very different sort of music tradition. Um, he's definitely interested, more interested in like prog rock he's a very technically accomplished player oh. um but he has a great ear and a great feel and and it's it's sort of thrilling because like a lot of the songs that we uh play in our repertoire we introduced to him he, there were songs he didn't realize and you know his feedback has been it's it sort of expanded his horizons so we haven't been able to play that much since the pandemic but um a week ago this past saturday um, the four of us got together. We had a gig out at Harvey's Lake, which is north of uh, Wilkes-Barre. Um, and uh, it was great. I mean, we played together, all four of us played together once last year, but this was only the second time since the lockdown um, from COVID-19 that we got together. And it was, it, it was, it really, it really clicked. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we're kind of running out on our radio time, so we have a few songs of yours. Uh, the first one I want to play is Camp Street. Tell me about it. Well, Camp Street, um, I lived on Camp Street when I was in New Orleans, and that sort of camp was one of the main arteries in the past in New Orleans until Magazine Street, which ran parallel to it one block over, sort of took his, it took it the main path. So it's a wider boulevard street, and there are a lot of lovely old homes on it. So, you know, I thought that was a great, I mean, that, that, that sort of location meant a lot to me because I would walk to Tipitina's. I'd walk to Domelisi's to get Poe Boys. I'd walk to the Butterfly to sit by the river. Um, so, uh, you know, I wrote that song sort of reminiscent. I recorded it on my album, Waves, as a funk song. But then when I wanted to do my acoustic project, um, Flare, um, I wanted to reinterpret it. Like when I did it as a funk tune on the album, but I wanted to give it more of an uptown New Orleans beat. And the drummer who plays on it, A.J. Jump, is very uh, accomplished with New Orleans-style music. You'll be able to hear from the track. With all that said, this is Camp Street by Joe Segan. Sun is setting, let's meet at the bar. I want to 
<laughs> that was Camp Street by Joe Zegan. Um, so you were just talking about Flair, uh, uh, why he called it Flair. Well, you know, I, I, I had this sort of pipe dream of uh, doing a, a, a live all acoustic recording session. And, uh, and it seemed like a pipe dream, but I mentioned it to my producer, Brett Alexander, and he said, oh yeah, we can do that. No problem. We'll do that at Paul's uh, at eight days a week. Uh, and I recommend anyone, if they're, if they're looking for a studio, uh, Paul does incredible work there. It's a lovely studio. It's, uh, uh, and, and that session worked out well. And, you know, Brett um, produced the session and, and Paul engineered the session and, uh, you know, we, we had uh, Nike Van Wick from Craig Thatcher's band playing fiddle, John Ventry from Clarence Spady's band, uh, AJ Jump, who's played with everybody and is the proprietor of one of the most heralded music clubs in, uh, 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 up in Wilkes-Barre uh, that get, brings in all kinds of great acts. Huh. Uh, it's, it, it, it's not like a bar or anything. It's, it's just a, a music hall, but you know, AJ brings in some wonderful stuff. And Brett uh, played mandolin on it. And the mandolin that you heard is uh, my dad's, a 1914 Gibson mandolin. So it had a lot of, a lot of personal connection. But you know, I was driving up to, heading up north for a gig and I got stuck in an anvil at a, a light, and I looked up, and there was an RV, and it had uh, a tire cover on the spare tire that had a picture of a Pomeranian, and the Pomeranian looked so damn happy, and the scene just seemed so surreal. I had to take a picture of it, and I used it as as the cover art for the EP <laughs> Flair. Now I did, I did alter digitally alter the license plate, so right, I was not, I was not, you know, tr trying to disclose personal identification information. Um, but uh, it's sort of nice. I'm a big fan of sort of found art, and I view that as found art. You know, like mm -hmm. my my work with uh, Joe Tolsell, JT, and the Blue Mountain Stone. I used to love working with Joe um, because he would take on sort of grandiose projects. He was, oh, somewhere in Eastern Europe. And there was a religious ceremony going on in the square below, and 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 it was the service was in another language, but he, he it just inspired him so much. He thought it was so beautiful that he he uh, stuck his iPhone out the window and did a you know an audio recording with his iPhone, and then he took it back to his studio, and the main melody line he developed into a new song. And uh, he, w you know, w w we played that song, but he took the, the found art, this other recording of this religious piece that he has no idea what it was and had it integrate into the, huh. the, the recording. So it was, it was really nice, uh, you know, to, 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 to be inspired by found art. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. There, uh, there was a, a rap piece done, I, I think, but uh, what they did is that they sampled the audio from the Golden Gate Bridge. If you didn't know, did you know that? Um, I that, think I've heard this story. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the Golden Gate Bridge was engineered in such a way that, or, or I can't remember if it was engineered or it just happened to be. So, uh, but whenever it gets really, really windy, as it does, and and there, uh, it creates a very eerie noise, uh, unsettling noise when it goes through like the. Uh, bars of the fence or, or whatever it's called but it's so loud that you can like, hear it from uh the shores of and he, so he recorded it and he incorporated it into a song i have to find that because i know it's a true story uh i saw, I guess I, I saw it on, on a jeopardy thing <laughs> but i thought that wow that's so cool that you could just sample stuff and, and pl plug it in i should have what, what i should have done i went to st louis and uh uh, the noises that it makes in the arch, yeah, it's wild. Huh. And it, have you have you ever been to St. Louis? I have not. Oh, that I recommend it. It's uh, so so they had like the original elevators in place, and it's it's this wild contraption because it's not like an escalator where you just it's like a train, but it's, since it's like going a, up a curve, like a funicular sorta. Uh, I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> but um, it, it's it, it's a it's a train, but every time it goes up. You know the angle changes, mm -hmm. so it it will automatically change with it. Oh, okay, yeah. But it's really piston like, so it's like, and yeah, you, like, you slowly the go, air, yeah, and you can slowly, yeah, yeah, and it's you're in, like this barrel, like legitimately barrel sized, uh, 
like like a, a six foot barrel because I could barely stand up in it. Huh. Um, or maybe like a five foot, I guess if that's the case. But uh, yeah, it's it, the, the noises were really incredible. That I I should have recorded, but I maybe maybe it was because you weren't allowed to use your phones, which would make sense. I mean, so many artists. I've heard this over over, over again, and I find this to be true. That if you want to create, you got to be a good listener. Yeah. And you got to be receptive to what goes on around you and reflect that back on people. Yeah, that, that's that's very true. I know so many uh, rappers that, uh, up in New York City that use uh, samples from the street lights or they go to the docks and, re- and record some of the horns that they hear yeah. or the, the, the clanks of whatever happens over yeah. in the docks. And they use that in the recordings, and it's like, or they make beats out of it even. And I'm like, how do you even, how do you even go out and be like, all right, I want to record this thing, this donk or this clonk, and turn that into like a, a like a hip hop beat? Yeah. How do you do that? How do you even create the mindset to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to be like, I'm gonna make a beat, bot, uh, a hip hop beat out of this, uh, out of the the clink clonks of a ship against the dock? <laughs> it's incredible to me. Well, life is musical. Yeah. Um, we have uh, another one of your songs, Good Times Never Seem to Last. Good Times Never Last. Yeah, this is a song. Uh, this is the first one that uh, I wrote with Brett Alexander, the producer I've been working with, the first time we collaborated on a tune. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was very interesting. Um, I had a progression and a melody and some words that I've been trying to develop into a song. And uh, I had those kicking around for a number of years and I brought it to the session and Brett had a tune he was working on and the imagery sort of matched. Mm. And we sort of, we sort of like rewrote his lyrics and made some changes to the, the tune. And uh, we're very happy with the result. And uh, you know, we uh, Brett hired AJ jump who played on the flare sessions uh, to come in and lay down the drums, and Brett and I played all the other instruments. And I think on this one, I might be playing four guitars. Let me see. I think my ES three thirty five's on it, a Telecaster, and my Oracle guitar. I bought, you know, a number of our our mutual friends um, play Oracle guitars from Todd Johnst- Johnston. Todd Johnston oh, yeah, over Todd, in Harrisburg, yes, that's right. and Todd's going to be displaying some of his work at uh, at Roots and Blues next weekend. So you know, definitely check it. Todd is. He makes wonderful guitars, and uh, I, I cherish the one uh, that I have. And the worst thing about it is now I just want more. <laughs> I want another. <laughs> it's always it's always the uh, stereotype, isn't it? It's like, honey, I got to go get a new guitar. Well, how many guitars does a guitar player need? Always All of them. just one more. Just, just one, one more. more. Exactly. <laughs> just one more. <laughs> All right, well, with all that said, this is Good Times Never Last or Never Seen. Good Times Never Last. By Joe Segan. These quiet streets and vacant stores Nobody come around here no more Used to be a band in every bar no fights, no derelicts, no cover charge. An empty bottle and a broken glass. Why do the good times never seem to last? They say a heart is big as a fist. Mine's full of love for everyone I miss. The beat binds us all through the years. We dance together through laughs and tears everything changes all things must pass why do the good times never seem to last the bars all closed and the band tore down the crowds are gone in my hometown they grab their coats and fumble for their keys where do you go when all the amateurs leave i got a pawn shop amp and a telecaster Enough on my own, happy ever after A sweet melody in a three-minute song You could sing or maybe hum along Take my hand, our time is fading fast Why do the good times never seem to last? Crowd. 
crowds are gone in my hometown Everything changes, all things must pass Why do the good times never seem to last? Why do the good times never seem to last? Why do the good times never seem to last? Why do the good times never seem to last? And that's Good Times Never Last by Joe Segan. Uh, where can people find you? Well, you can f- f- Google me. You'll find me. Oh, really? I, 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 JoeSegan.com is my website. Um, any, you know, you could search my name on Apple Music, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, YouTube. My, my music's up there too. And uh, on my website, I don't have that. I have to upload um, that single that you just heard, but my album and my EP are available for free. You could download them or stream them directly from my website. That's awesome. Uh, what are some upcoming, upcoming gigs for you? Mm, upcoming gigs for me. <laughs> You see, they all sort of blend together. That's, uh, that's well. Right. Tomorrow, um, I'm going to be playing with uh, Matt Wanger um, uh, at, at Springgate Arcona, and I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I always enjoy playing with Matt. I first met Matt. He runs a, a number of jams in the area, and he plays with Jeff Bragg a lot. I'm a big fan of Jeff's playing also. But he, I went to uh, Matt's Americana jams down at Phantom Power, and 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 in the city at Telus. And met a bunch of gr- really nice fellas. And, you know, I love going down there for an afternoon, having some laughs, drinking a couple beers, picking some tunes. Uh, and Matt is a, has a real knack for, you know, keeping it friendly, keeping it light, and keeping everyone engaged. So, uh, and I always like playing with him because he has great taste. He has, mm. uh, his, he has an excellent rep- repertoire. He's turned me on to some songs that were not in my repertoire that I've, that, that I've learned since and that uh, I really enjoy. So, yeah. yeah. That's, that's one thing I keep, I keep getting, I keep getting a bunch of repertoire to listen to every time someone comes on. It's like, you haven't heard of this person? It's like, no, I, I haven't. I'm only, it's funny. People expect me to know a lot, of, a lot of music, like all the names that you use. The only one that I really recognize was Fat Domino. Fats Domino. Fats Domino. Yeah, that's the oh, only one great. that like recognized. So I'm gonna have to uh, tune into all these other uh, all those other people's because. Well, you know, um, Bobby Charles used to write for Fats, and he's one of my favorite songwriters. You know, Bjorn covers Bobby Charles. Big Bobby Does Charles he? fan. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, Bobby Charles is. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend you check checking him out. He was uh, he was an incredible songwriter. Bobby Charles. I will. Um, but. I, <clears throat> going back to uh, events i'm sure you can find all those uh, on your website too yeah you right? can find yeah, uh, and, and i post on facebook you know follow me and 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 and, and share uh, i mean i've been playing i have gigs back home in northeast pennsylvania once a month with mm-hmm. my band the benders um, we'll be back at harvey's lake on the 23rd out on danny's deck and i'm doing some gigs with brett alexander uh of the badleys in july and august i mean i used to play with brett gig with him doing duos before I started recording with him. And uh, I love his repertoire. I mean, I'm a big Badleys fan. And, you know, to uh, learning those, those songs and playing them uh, with the creator is thrilling. Right. You know, it's really wild. You know, like, and, and songs that, you know, Brett wrote that, you know, charted. And it was uh, is delightful, and you know, um, we've been playing at Springgate. His daughter uh, is also a music educator. Um, Harlow, wonderful person. Um, she wor- she uh, works in Mechanicsburg. So so Brett does gig down here, and he, he told me he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll come down and do gigs with you just because it gives me a uh, you know a chance to, to to see my daughter. So we're going to be playing at uh, you know the, the Springgate Brewery uh, Sunday the twenty fourth with Brett, and it's it's always fun because you know we generally get a decent number of Badleys fans, and they get excited when we do the Badleys music. Yeah. Um, and as as I do, too. And, and plus, you know, Brett, Brett has incredible uh, taste. We do a lot of Van Morrison. I mean, Brett, when he was in the Badleys, toured with Van Morrison. Badleys were a supporting mm. act. Well, he, I mean, he's toured with Almonds, Bob Seger, a lot of, a lot of other Bob acts. Bob Seger. 
Yeah, yeah, that was the last one. I think the last tour that the Badleys went out on, they did a leg with Bob Seger opening for Bob Seger. Huh. So that was maybe about eight, nine years ago, maybe. Oh, wow. But um, the Badleys are active again. Um, they're recording a new album. Um, uh, they're recording it at Paul Smith's studio eight days a week. And uh, they, have a, they have a bunch of gigs. I mean, I saw them at the Englewood. Um, they had two sold-out nights in, back in February, uh, and that was that was delightful, especially not having to drive because the, the other reunion gig last summer was up in Pittston and I had to mm. drive two and a half hours to see that one. But it was worth it. Worth it. Sure. It was, it, it, the sunburn. It was worth it, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, sunburn. I'm still dealing with sunburn. That I like you can if I raise my arm up, you would see a, a, a streak of white around red. And oh my I'm goodness! Yeah, <laughs> well, but I but this is over a year old at this point. Like I oh got my God. third, like second degree, or oh. uh, the most the degree sunburn you could ever get, and it's still you can still because what I did, I went oh. and all like, and, but I didn't like rub it in. Yeah. So there's a clear path you can see. Oh. <laughs> so it's like the worst kind of sunburn you get. Yeah. I, I, I pretty much got it tattooed on me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and a week worth of pain and not being able to wear a shirt at all. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, but whatever. Yeah. Um, we're going to end off on the radio. So if you want to if you want to check out more of our conversation, uh, you can come over to facebook.com forward slash the, forward slash the story, Corey Rosen, that's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. And you can uh, like and subscribe there. You can also search the story, Corey Rosen, on all streaming platforms to catch up to date with with all of my past episodes, and but if you want to see future guests, be sure to head over to Instagram and uh, Facebook to that's because that's where I post those things. Uh, with all that said, we're gonna let you guys get back to the radio. All right, cool. So the Badleys, uh, uh, I've never heard of them. Are they a bigger band? Um, they're from Ceilings Grove, and uh, they used to be, I forget the name of the label, but it was a subsidiary of Arista. And, you know, I, I used to go see them in clubs before they were signed, mm. and, and that, that, was a, that was a hell of a lot of fun, just because their music was great. They were a high-energy band, and it was, you know, great to be in a room with a lot of people grooving on music. Um, and I did, I saw them, I think I saw them open for uh, uh, the Almond Brothers, up at uh, Montage in oh, Scranton, wow. Wilkesbury, and that was that was the first that was the first time I think I saw them after I graduated from law school, and you know, uh, but yeah, they were uh, I, they they had a couple hits that uh, charted very well on Billboard. Uh, Angelina's mm-hmm. coming home, Fear Falling. So I, I mean, I, I love playing both those songs with Brett. Oh wow, that's awesome! In fact, I want I want to start doing Fear Falling. You may see me doing that out, out at some point. <laughs> cool, man. So, uh, you you mentioned networking a lot, mm. uh, or at least in, in before the show. How does one go and network? How does one? How did you find success doing it? Got to go out and press the flesh. Got to go out and you know shake hands and you know meet people and Just talk babies. to people. And it's not it's not easy. <laughs> you know, like I used to have uh, when I was living in the Northeast. I'd set aside one evening to try to go out and find gigs and go out and, 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 you know, meet owners and whatnot. So yeah, really, uh, I mean, networking is sort of critical uh, for the purposes of trying to develop opportunities and develop connections. And it's, at least in Lancaster, it's not that hard because people are so open. It's not Mm. that hard to network um, because there, when I first came out, I I had the uh, assumption that it, that you just don't walk up to somebody and talk to them, um, and it, that's not the, really the case at all. It, granted, when they're doing their set, leave them alone. Right. But <laughs> but afterwards, that you can go up and talk to them, and they're more than happy to to talk to you. And uh, if uh, they'll they'll direct you to other people, and they'll direct you to like an open mic. Because no, no one's gonna sign you off the bat, but if you go to an open mic with them, they, they'll see what you're about, and 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 that way you can get network to other people and not, and uh, play with other people. Because I've been uh, the first night that I came out to Lancaster ever ever to play an open mic was Telus 360. Uh, 
uh, with a friend. And from from that one night, uh, Cody Bilburn, <laughs> Cody Kilburn, Cody, Cody Bilburn is a fun, is a love name I call him. <laughs> but uh, Cody Kilburn uh, is uh, a wonderful guitarist that I've had on previously, and he was out. And there's a piano. There was a piano out there. Uh, whenever the pianos are in season, mm-hmm. uh, and he was like, I was playing along. I was playing a little bit, and he was like, Oh, can you play this song? And he, he gives me Jealous, that song, a song he likes to play. And I was like, Yeah, yeah, I'll figure it out, because uh, I'm really good at uh, chord sheets. Uh, if you hand me a chord sheet, I'll follow along very easily, as long as it's not too complex. Right. <laughs> um, and from from then on, he invited me to to his band, and that's really where I got all the spread i got into bjorn uh mm. bjorn circle i got into nathan arndt circle that way uh and it's it it's incredible how if you just go out there and present yourself uh not not even you don't have to do you don't have to jump through hoops to to do it either mm. uh, you just go out there and perform and people people will either walk up to you or you, you can just walk up to other people and say, hey, where can I find you or this music or that music? Right. And it's very, very much open. Yeah, and I also like the fact that, um, I mean, the open mics are very good and they're very different. Oh, um, yes. But, you know, they're, I mean, professionals will come out and play yeah. and sign up or professionals just come out and hang out. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a great way to network with folks who are interested in celebrating music Mm -hmm. i can't tell you how many times i've been to the telus open mic and some people from like las vegas acts are in there or people from the dutch apple came over to perform well last uh um not this past thursday but two weeks before that uh i went to uh, hell in a bucket Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember if I saw you there that week, but, but 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 there was a gentleman who was traveling on his way to Maine was his next stop, mm-hmm. and he f- found out about the bucket and he came and played the open mic and he he did his set and you know we met him and a lot of people were talking to him he's a fascinating fellow uh, very cordial, and we may see him again or we may never see him again but it I, was just you know we were we were on his path. And, you know, uh, he said, well, I hope I see you all somewhere down the road. And, you know, our response was, as he was walking across the street to his car was, well, we'll be here. Right, yeah. He's, <laughs> Hell in a Bucket is, is a, in Wrightsville. It's a really, really cool spot. Um, really, uh, I like the chili. They have really good chili. I haven't had the chili yet. No, it's, no. it's only six bucks. It's really good. Cool. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's 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 crazy how, how some people, yeah, like traveling acts will just come through and, and stop by and, and play and you know you might not see ever see him again but you but you can make those connections right yeah and it, it's 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 awesome unfortunately i have my my job uh, i teach children how to swim uh so it's four to eight o'clock at night that's Ooh. why i'm always coming in late to like hell in a bucket to like tell us yeah uh unfortunate but you, you, you know gotta have a day Gigs job a gig, right? yeah yeah right um, and it's also hard to get gigs because of that as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to know. Have a conflict. Yeah. I have to know. Well, I, well, typically the way, the way it's run, um, I, I get paid, I, I do get paid uh, pretty well, but, uh, most of the time a gig is more worth it than, than, uh, a night at, at the job. Right. Uh, so I will go out to a gig over, over the, uh, the job, which is fun, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, so I, that way I don't have to necessarily prioritize, Either one, I can do both and still come out on top. Right. So it, it's nice. Um, and, and working with children, as you said, is is a joy and a half. Yeah, it really is. Uh, what are some of your favorite moments from teaching uh, guitar? Um, my favorite moments teaching guitar are running into uh, my old students. You know, I, a couple years ago, I was in a bar, and one of my old students, who was a, an educator, he was a professor at Harvard, oh, wow. comes in, and, he, and, and he's like, still playing, and still creating, and still doing it, but he has his other side job. Like, most of my students have gone that route, that, you know, they still have music in their lives. And, you know, I told him at, at the outset, you know, I'm not a 
professional musician. I do not have a degree in music education. I'm going to try to help them on their path. I view myself more as a personal tra- music trainer, mm. and more, more, than, more than a teacher, trying to get them to where they want to go uh, faster. Um, but I told them at the outset, you know, my, my, my real goal is to foment a lifelong love of creating and playing music with others. And when I run into people or like when I see their posts on social media about playing music, those are the moments where that, that make me happy because music is an oral tradition. It's handed down and like people uh, take what they've heard before and present it in a new way. So it's, it, it's familiar to the listener, but yet it's different. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, when you get the, the Goldilocks balance of familiar and different at the same time, that's when you're really on the right track. It's, uh, I can't tell you how many uh, countless times we, we've played like House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> yeah. And every, every time it's played differently, people go nuts still every single time it's played uh, for, for the most part. Um, yeah it's a cultural it's a cultural class it's a cultural hit and i've (laughs) i like to perform it almost every single open mic so maybe it gets a little bit boring for some people who play it constantly i I have a story about the house of the rising i'm sorry i'm sorry did i cut you off Uh, no no go for it um when when my last year in new orleans one of my friends uh rented an apartment in the french quarter and he would throw parties because he had a great location and it was nice to have a home base you know could go out in the quarter and you could stay his place and he had you know all the all of the buildings and apartments in the French Quarter have balconies because that's where you would dump your sewage because nobody mm-hmm. had plumbing back in mm-hmm. when New Orleans was founded and you would the, the streets were basically full of sewage they'd wash it out like you come out your chamber pot and you go dump it yep. on the street um, but like we were all hanging out on his balcony and a tour came through in like a, a, a carriage and the tour director, you know, was like, here we find the historic house of the rising sun. This structure used to be a brothel. And, you know, we were all very excited at that time. We overheard that everybody's toasting and like, yes, we're in the house of the rising sun. And this was before the internet. I mean, the internet existed, but it was not widely available. Right. You know, like I had Westlaw with my Mac, my Mac Classic, you know, or I could do my research, but it, I, I, there, there wasn't any, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of content. And so, you know, now I've gone back and Googled that. Oh, that was nonsense. That was not. <laughs> oh, it wasn't. I was going to say. But it was fun at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's something that's totally something a tour company would do. Just like you pick this random. House. Oh, and this is the <laughs> famous house of the rising sun. Cause Just because you, you rubes don't know any better, right? Exactly. <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. Oh my god, it was a good time at the time. Yeah, that's true. It was, it was like an active party. It'd be like, yeah, the house of the rising sun, and then you just look up later. It's like. Actually, no, it's no. Like baloney. But it was it was down the street from the schoolyard um, where uh, the outdoor scenes of Elvis's first movie, King Creole, with Walter Matthau, the black and white film, which is mm. one of Elvis's better movies. I, I'm a fan of Elvis, and you know when uh, the first time a hurricane was projected to hit New Orleans, I came back from class and I was like, "All right, we got to tape up the windows, we got to do everything." And I, my house mate Pablo De Castro, we went to law school together, and we were. We like to we like to run together. He was a, a very good friend and very good company. He said, "No, we're going to Graceland. We're getting out of Dodge. This is dangerous stuff. We're not staying here for the hurricane." So we drove all night to uh, to Memphis and uh, yeah, to, oh, yeah, wow. to, to go see Elvis. And like we're, we're we're driving past Graceland. We had no plan. No, didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to stay. And we dr- we're driving past Graceland, and there's an Elvis impersonator. It's the middle of the night. It's like three in the morning. We got there. There's an Elvis impersonator running across the street, waving at us. So like, there's nobody around. So like, Pablo goes up the street and turns around, to, pulls a U-turn because we wanted to ask him where we could stay, and he was gone. Oh wow! It, it, but it was a big boulevard. We couldn't imagine. It was like he was a, a ghost that disappeared. I mean, it didn't look like Elvis. It looked like an Elvis impersonator, right. but. But it was sort of neat. But right across the street from Graceland at that time was the Memory Lane Hotel. And on their marquee, they said 24-hour Elvis movies, and they had a guitar-shaped pool. So we were like, we were sold. We stayed there. And and I think I've seen every, like, 
one one night we got back from from the bars and we're watching the Elvis movies and all of a sudden we get static and I'm pissed so I call down the desk and I'm like I thought it says 24 hour Elvis <laughs> movies and we were watching static here in the middle of the night and 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 the and the guy working the desk is like well what do you want to see I said well what do you got he said we got every one of them I said girls 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 and put it on repeat until we say when <laughs> That's so funny. I've I've only been in the movie theater where something went wrong once, and it was the funniest thing because we were in there to see Aquaman, mm. and um and it's a Warner Brothers production, and so we go in there expecting to see a bunch of Warner Brothers ads like trailers, right? But we go in there and we start seeing a bunch of Disney ads, and I'm like, why in the world would Warner Brothers uh precurse their trailer with a bunch of Disney ads? And I'm I'm sitting there like. What is that? What kind of marketing ploy is this? Uh, what are they doing here? Um, and the, and then the movie starts playing. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. It's, it's gonna be Aquaman. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be great. And uh, it 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 starts playing the the Return of Mary Poppins. Oh boy! And I'm like, what? <laughs> This is not what not I want to see. No, no, this is not. A, well, Grant, I, 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 I like Mary Poppins, and uh, yeah. I, I wanted, I want to see that movie. But it's like I'm here to see action, and, right. and I want to see sharks being flown at other people. Yeah, like, right. you know, what, what, whatever nonsense that Aquaman is. Uh, I, I mean, non nonsense in a in a loving fiction, way. yes, very yes, loving right. way, yeah, yes. over the top, yes, yes. Um, and and the people start. Boo! You know, whatever, and, and I was like, "How? How did? How did this happen?" Yeah. Uh, so we we saw like the first five minutes of, of the Return of Mary Poppins, and we, we had to wait again for all the other previews to go oh, uh, for no. Aqu- <laughs> for Aquaman, which is like twenty minutes of previews. yeah, right, yeah. So, but uh, we got to see Aquaman in in the end, and, we, and uh, I think we got a refund too. So that's cool. Yeah. So all's well that ends well. So we, we went into the next theater and watched the, the other movie. <laughs> So yeah, it was a weird, weird event. Um, that's crazy. Uh, are you gonna go see the new Elvis movie? Um, I've, I'll probably wait till it's streaming. I don't get to the theaters that much. I did get mm-hmm. out to see the most recent Doctor Strange movie. I am a movie enthusiast. Yes, you're very much a, a, a Star Wars fan of it. I do like Star Wars. I like the Star Wars stuff. I've been enjoying the the new Obi Wan series. Has been fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I'm excited for. Uh, Ahsoka and uh, Mandalorian three. Very much so. Yeah, me Very too. Much so, um, so you talk about uh, your music and your your fanaticism for music. What what are if you could give anybody a top three to listen to, who would who would they be? Top three artists that artists they may not be aware of. That they may not be aware of. Well, I'd say number one is Professor Longhair, Henry Roland Bird. Um, who's one of the classic New Orleans piano professors. Uh, he's very influential to like Alan Toussaint and, and Dr. John. And his vocals very much remind me of Elvis. Mm. Um, so I'd, I'd definitely say uh, Professor Longhair. Um, that's that's sort of it, it's sort of hard because I, I have very diverse sort of oh, that's good. tastes. That's good. Um so, uh, can I consult my phone? You can may consult your phone. I will give you space to do so. I want to. I want to. I want to look at. I, I, I just want to look at what I've been playing recently because I know I'm going to forget uh, something. Um, some, some you know, those... one thing I, I, I I've enjoyed uh, uh, psychedelic music. Oh, really? And um, you you know the band XTC? I do not. Um, wonderful band. Uh, they're, they're, good, they're, they're, they're most, they're, mo- they're most, uh, famous album Skylarking was produced by Todd Rundgren and they're very accomplished musicians, but they played alt music in, in the eighties, but they're also big fans of 60 psychedelia, like Pink Floyd and whatnot, like early Pink Floyd. So they created a fictional band XTC and they call themselves Dukes of the Stratosphere and they dress them all in psychedelic outfits and the, and the, and the album that they put out chips from the chocolate fireball is an encyclopedia of every sort of psychedelic style. So I would recommend number one, Professor Longhair. Number two, Dukes of Stratosphere. Um, I must say, uh, the band named XTC for a psychedelic band is 
pure genius. Well, yeah, you know, for XTC, the album that I'd recommend is one of my most influential, and it's not the one that people are most uh, followed, but Oranges and Lemons is 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 a, just a magnificent album, and especially a guitar album, because at that time, um, there wasn't a lot of focus on guitar as an instrument. It was mostly uh, synthesizers in the 80s, and it was thrilling to me with it, to have a band that, you know, used synthesizers, but also had an incredibly accomplished guitar player. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll come up with my third in a second. Let me just uh, zip through. One of the th- people I've been really influenced by is the new Star Wars composer. Uh, jo- what's his name? Garan jo- Johansson? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like his work too. I'm, I'm also really impressed with the work of uh, um, uh, Natalie Holt, who did the soundtrack and developed the themes that uh, John Williams wrote for Obi Wan. Obi Wan, yeah. I thought the music for uh, and, and unfortunately, it just came out um, uh, yesterday, uh, or no, actually, I think it was a week from yesterday. Oh yeah, yeah they, he's which, retiring. Which I would have liked that soundtrack to be issued before the show came out because I think the show would have had more impact if I was familiar with the soundtrack. But oh, you know, it is what it is. Oh, did you hear about uh, John Williams retiring? Well, he's he's threatening that he's going to retire after he finishes the Indiana Jones soundtrack, which that is the one he's wor- he's working on, the one that he's working on uh, right now. Okay, yeah, the third al- the, the third artist. I, I this was sort of obvious. I would say you got to check out one of my favorite Brett Alexander project, the Cellar Birds. Cellar Birds. The Cellar Birds. This is you know, some of the guys of the Badleys are in it, but this was Brett's sort of masterstroke, um, and it is an incredibly brilliant album. You could download it from Brett's website. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. And, and it's funny how, you know, like I, I I was doing a private gig. Um, somebody, the party got rescheduled and somebody called me for a fill in. I was doing a a private gig here in Mannheim township a couple of weeks ago. And one of the guests, uh, who came up to me afterwards, he spent most of his life as a studio musician in LA. Hmm. And we were, sort of talking about music and, you know, our, our, our interests. And, you know, I mentioned that I've been working with Brett and he just said, Oh, the Cellar Birds album is, well, wow, that's one of my favorite albums. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that, that is, that is one of my favorite albums too. So, oh, wow. you know, I, I'd recommend checking out Brett's original work and uh, his work with Gentleman East, I guess Gentleman East was down here. It's a, uh, it's uh, Ron Samasic drummer for the Badleys, Paul Smith, bass player from the Badleys, Brett, uh, guitar, uh, guitar songwriter for the Badleys, and Aaron Fink, who was the original guitar player for Breaking Ben. Um, great band. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you had talked about what it was like to... Uh, oh, here's a question. Um, your, your dad's music shop, was that ever a, a place of... Did you ever get to like explore to like, use different instruments? What kind of what kind of instruments did you sell? All instruments. Well, my, it was mostly like a, it was like a mom and pop, and it was focused on students and lessons. I gotcha. mean, pros would come in because uh, you know when I was younger, my dad dealt Fender and Gibson, and he was the biggest Fender and Gibson dealers in the area. But it was mostly you know the the, the store was run on the students that would come in and buy stuff, and I spent my Saturdays there, and I'd polish the instruments. Uh, dust i'd take care of customers and i and my job was to go get lunch like my dad would give me money oh. and i'd go around to all the teachers what do you want what do you want and my dad would buy them lunch every saturday i'd go get it um and uh you know so yeah i i pretty much had free reign and as i got older i i i would fly solo there um but you know i enjoyed i mean since i was enthusiastic about the guitars and i knew about them i could sell them because you mm. know I could talk about them and what the difference is between, you know, a single coil pickup and a humbucker pickup and, you know, stylistically, which instruments fit with which kind of music. Not that that's necessarily a rule you should follow, but if you, you're trying to emulate a particular right. style, at least you know what tools have been used to create that. Uh, so you, you've had many teachers over your life. I've had many teachers many over teachers. my life. What are some of the key lessons or things that you've learned from them? Yeah, that's that's sort of hard. I mean, I, I you know, I there was this one teacher who was a, a bit of a hermit, <laughs> and he taught out of his house, and he was uh, chain smoked, filterless Lucky Strikes. He had an ashtray 
I mean, it looked like a swimming pool. It'd be filled with all the butts. I mean, really, they'd be stacked up there and he'd be lighting off there. Like the room just stank of cigarettes. Um, but he really was deep into philosophy, particularly Gurdjieff. And um, he was, uh, he got me to look at music from uh, a conceptual area, you know, because he, he, his, his big mantra was that there are no uh, uh, bad notes, just bad ideas. That all, we, yeah. we, we work in a 12 note system. It's all about context right. and presentation. And, you know, there isn't a wrong note. It's mm-hmm. just how you connect it and how you, how you lead the, 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 the listener to appreciate that. And he developed a series of technical exercises, which developed my right hand picking technique and, and my speed, which I've, I've relied upon. And while I, in the first half hour of the lesson, he would have you going through these and he would check your posture. And he was really big on, you know, you can't be tense. You can't have your neck tense. You can't, you can't impede the flow. You have to, it has to be natural. It has to be relaxed. And he also taught me a lot about jazz and he was, his, his big thing was improvisation. So, you know, you, you had to improvise a lot and, 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 and it was all about learning standards and improvisation. So, um, it was eye opening for me to have a guitar teacher that had his own way. And we, I did not learn out of a book. Mm-hmm. You bought a manuscript book. He wrote the lesson out every week. There was never a public, it was, we never dealt with publication. So I thought he, he, he taught me a lot um, just because he, he was such a, uh, he did not like idiom players. He did not like it when I'd play blues licks. He's like, why are you imitating something else? You find your own path. And, and, and there was some conflict with that. I, I'm not wholesale into it because I do believe in idiom. I do believe yeah. in in context, but I also that doesn't mean I totally discount his philosophy either. Right. But it, it sort of opened me up to that. That break the rules. Yeah, you gotta you gotta know the rules, and then you can break them. And that's where the real good stuff comes from. True. The real original and good stuff comes. But well, it's, it's the visionaries. I yeah, mean, the, yeah, when you're right. when you're when you're plotting a new path that hasn't been mined. Yeah. I mean, look at our mutual friend Bjorn. I mean, he's cultivated a style that's very unique and very compelling. It's wild. Yeah. Is um we're having him on Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Cool. I'll tune in for that. Yeah. Uh if you've never heard Bjorn play any of his songs, it is a ride and a half. There are yeah. style changes midway through the song, meter changes all over the place. Some have you ever listened to his album on Spotify? I didn't know he had an album on Spotify. The Gentry. Look up the uh, T H the uh, and G E N T R Y. He and that's where he gets into a lot of uh, uh, electronic music. That's where that's what he uh, alleged. Uh, what I what I remember him saying. That's what he wants to get into next. Um, one of my favorite tracks from that is the I think that I love you remix. Uh, I think it's number one on that's on on the track, and I I just. From hearing all of his past work, like uh, The Wolf or A Million Bucks or uh, Mended Love or whatever, it's just so different than what Bjorn regularly does. And it's like, oh, and his voice is incredible, too. Yeah. It's uh, one of the things that always captured me. was He has, like, one of the most unique voices I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and uses it very well w- within his songs. Oh. It's, it's incredible. It's a great effect, yes. It's a great effect. Um, so yeah, definitely check out, uh, that episode on Wednesday at 10 30 AM or you can check it afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are some mistakes that maybe you have made or you've seen your students make and how do you get, how do we combat that? What are some advice you can give to help other people not make those same mistakes again? Well, I would say practicing. It's important to develop, uh, uh, a sort of plan when you practice your craft that you, you know, work on different skills. You're not working on the same stuff all the time, mm-hmm. uh, that you're pushing boundaries, that you, it's sort of a balance of like perfecting what you do and trying to play it better, cleaner, making sure your notes last the full duration, make sure there's no string buzz and also to sort of expanding your horizon. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think the biggest mistake people make is if they have the discipline to practice regularly, their practice becomes they do the same thing, right? It's and then it, and, and then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, 
it, 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 you may get the, the meditative benefits of sort of going through a task, but you're not really uh, refining your art or or, 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 or or pushing the boundaries on it. So, you know, a smart practice. And there are a number of teachers on YouTube um, that I'd, uh, Eric Haugen in particular, he has an incredible s strategy about uh, practice. If you Google him on YouTube, it's, uh, it's, it's rather fascinating. Google him on YouTube. Google him on YouTube, yeah. <laughs> I'm showing my age there. No, huh? no, it's, no it's, 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 it's fine. It's, well, because Google it now is, is its own word. It's ba yeah. basically mean search. Uh, but that was, just, that was just interesting to hear. Um, yeah, because practice, yes, you're right. Uh, without any furtherance of your skill, can you really call it practice? Right. Um, so you have to, yeah, you can practice the same old songs to refine them. Um, but that's just isn't practice, it's free time at that point. But that's just one element. Yeah, just one element. Yeah. yeah. Um, practice, you have to uh, learn, you have to invest in, in uh, different skills, uh, work on skills that you might, might not even like, but you can, yeah. then you can draw on them whenever, uh, whenever the feeling is right. Right. And it's it's so important to practice different scales all the time, to practice different uh, mode, uh, modes or genres at different times, because you can draw different genres into your own music and make it your own. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I've been doing a lot now is looking at different chord progressions of different genres and oh yeah, and uh, subbing them in for my own stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that's the way you do it. Well. Once a uh, teacher I studied with, Hank Mackey, when I was in New Orleans, a, a, a friend of mine encouraged me to take lessons with him and actually would drive me to the lessons because he knew I'd enjoy him so much. But Hank's, Hank was a real, he, he wanted his students not to focus on chords, but cadences, yes. a chord progression, right, and improvising over a chord progression and sort of getting the ins and outs because they're only, I mean, we only, in our system of music, they're only 12 notes. Now, I do appreciate that they're microtonal notes right. with the blues playing and whatnot, but, you know, strictly speaking, we're in a 12-tone yes. system and there are only so many options yeah. and, you know, they, and, and in popular music, you know, there are 12 keys, but, you know, probably like Five keys are the ones that get used. And there's only four chords of those five keys oftentimes being used. Right, right, right. So, you know, I've been sort of taking that lesson that I learned in the early 90s and, and sort of focusing. I take, you know, sort of cadences out of songs in my repertoire and try to really learn them, really get inside them and 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 look at like passing tones and, and common tones and neighbor and, tones. And, and, and neighbor tones Escape and see tones. how I could, uh, you know, connect you know because it's all about leading the listener yes. you know providing context to the listener Very much uh, so. so they could follow along with the musical idea and end up you know at the same destination with the performer so what's your songwriting process like we kind of talked about this uh pre-show but you have uh did we talk about a pre-show? Did we talk about? I think we did talk. I think we talked about a pre-show. I like to. Yeah. I, I like to. Uh, when I come across ideas that strike me as interesting, um, if it's something I'm playing, I make a little recording, a little video of it. If it, I, I also have a little black book, leather brown black book that I keep with me. If you know for ideas, concepts, phrases, mm -hmm. um, turn you know you, you know uh, and, and 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 I go to those resources when I try to pull. Uh, songs together and, and try to develop ideas that I that I sort of came across. Um, also, too, you know, I try to keep a highlighter with me when I read because mm. um, I'll like highlight words or passages um, that that just sort of fascinate me, and I could use them for inspiration. So, um, yeah, when I feel like writing a song, I go back to them and I de develop those ideas. Like this this song that uh, I just finished with Brett Alexander. I had two verses in a chorus in a chord progression, um, but I didn't really know. I wanted, like most songs I write, I like to have three acts, mm. you, you know, an introduction, a middle, and an ending, but they all sort of accomplish a different point, but they're all connected to each other. And um, when we got together with the writing session, it was sort of like, what do we want to say? What do we want to convey? What mm. do we want to create? How are we going to develop the concept that we we set the stage then we have to 
move that idea forward in some fashion and then present it to the listener in a different way. And so writing with Brett and going back and forth, it was fascinating how we, we, we did that. Because, you know, the, the, the name of the song is Ghost Light. Mm-hmm. And I was inspired from that idea. Um, Sunday mornings, this is, nobody really needs to know this, but my habit on Sunday morning is, is while I'm cleaning the bathroom and doing house chores, I put on CBS Sunday morning. And during the shutdown, they had a discussion about how theaters, you know, traditionally you had a ghost light. And, you know, part of it, it was related to superstition. So you don't anger the ghosts and they could dance by the light. And part of it was practical. So people who are coming into the theater while they're going to turn on the lights, they don't hurt themselves. And then during our, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it it became a sign of resilience that theaters can keep the ghost light on until the, until the performances resume. And I liked that concept. Mm -hmm. I stopped cleaning the bathroom and I came out and I was like, Wow, that's really cool. And I got my little black book and I wrote Ghost Light in it. So when I was talking to Brett about it, you know, I, I, I wanted to, the, the refrain that I came up with is keep a ghost light burning in your heart. When mm. you're down, when you're stuck, keep a ghost light burning. And, you know, Brett and I sort of talked about, you know, like what we, did we want to convey by these other verses? And it was sort of like a persistence, a resilience that, you know, um, even a fall from grace, you could reattain things and you know all the things that sort of like what what could be conceived as a shutdown not just necessarily from a pandemic but on a personal level right. if you go through some type of personal crisis or your health crisis mm. or a family crisis and um you know that's now it, it, you, you're you're probably not going to get that from the words and that really doesn't matter to me because you know i like music that is subject to personal interpretation. Somebody may listen to it and come up with something else. And I, I think that's great. I don't care if they view it as I, the way I view it, but that's the process. Right. So you've had many shows. Uh, what are some of the funniest or maybe worst things that have ever happened during a show? Ooh. It's hard to say. Oh, really? Is it that many or is it just that few? Um, well, we're, we're not broadcasting on the radio now, right? No. Okay. Well, uh, probably the funniest thing uh, in college. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can admit to this one. I'll find another story because, you know, taken out of context, it, it, it could leave folks with the, the wrong impression. Right. But uh, I'll give you a recent example. Um, uh, I was playing at the bucket and I wanted to do it as a duo. And I reached out to Henry Dvorak, our, yeah. mu- our mutual friend. And I played with Henry a number of times. And I really like the way he plays his fretless bass. Oh, yes. And, you know, and I like having an accompanist that allows me to solo. Mm. And like I have some jazz influence and the fretless bass really works well with that. So I asked Henry if he wanted to do the gig with me and he did. And, you know, I put a list of like 50 songs together that we could do together. And when we showed up to the gig, he was missing the screw to attach his bass to the stand. So he could not play his fretless bass. It's the upright one, right? The upright one. Yeah. So fortunately, I brought a backup guitar, and he played that. And his dad brought a bass for the second set, and he played bass with me for the second set, like a Fender, Mm -hmm. I think it was a jazz bass. Um, And the third set, I gave him his choice, and he decided to play guitar. And the fact that, you know, like, that was something that, traditionally would be considered something went wrong. Right. But we rolled with the punches and we had a great gig and we had a good crowd and the people were engaged and they liked it very much. And we had fun playing, even though it was not what we expected. So, you know, I really try not to be thrown by those types of things when, you know, you you, got to roll with it. Well, I, I, I mean, you, you, you take what could be perceived as a disadvantage and turn it into an advantage. Mm-hmm. I mean, one thing that, you know, uh, I, I found I was, when I first got into home recording, I was overwhelmed by choices. And, um, you know, I, all my favorite music was done at a time where the technology, you know, people had a four track or an eight track and it was direct to tape and whatnot. And that's why I sort of got away from home recording and started working with Brett and his studio, Saturation Acres, 
because experience matters. And I didn't have to worry about how to mic the amp or, all the or if we're going to reamp or if we're going to re reamp a channel. Yeah, I have somebody, you know, worrying about that. And I'm worrying more about the performance and presentation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, what is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started? And this can be related to, to law or music or just life in general. I think, you know, with music, um, as, as a guitar player in my early years, just the lead guitar player who would blow when it was time to blow a solo and, and, and provide rhythm uh, backup, I don't think I focused on songs as much. I mean, music is about songs. Like, I learned scales and I learned leads, but really what I should have been doing was learning melodies of songs and progressions mm -hmm. of songs. Um, because that is the language of the art. And that is, you know, so I think as a younger player, I was too deep in the weeds. I wanted to know what that magic scale was. I wanted to know that magic lick. Where really what I should have been doing is familiar, familiarizing myself with complete songs. And that's what I do now. Um, so, and I think it was something that I, I, I wish I came to a realization. I wish I made a lot earlier. Yeah, and then... And Oftentimes, that's that's the answer, really, to that question. Anyway, what is that magic lead? What is that magic uh, riff? Whatever is uh, when you listen to the songs and you listen to more and more and more, and you understand it. That's where you get the understanding of oh, this is the magic lick. Because there is no one magic lick. There's right. a magic lick for every scenario. The only way you find that is by listening to the songs and uh, like getting an understanding from that. Yeah, you have to internalize the song. Yes. And, and, and music cannot be forced. It cannot oh, be no. labored. It, I mean, it, there's a, a lot of repetition in your musical training. So when you're ultimately uh, performing, it's not a... It's not a thought. It's not a conscious process. It's not, you're not, you're not thinking hard about it. You're going with the flow. And uh, so yeah, it's interesting how, how, how much time in, 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 in making music is spent with preparation. Yeah, uh, the... One thing I, I wish I had done more in my coll college years, and granted, I'm still young, so I guess I'm, so I'm starting to do it now, uh, is I wish I had done like arpeggios or I yeah. really studied on, on the scales or uh, like technique stuff that I can uh, I could just pull out whenever I needed to yeah. instead of on the spot thinking, oh, I know this would sound great. However, I don't have the technique down to do it consistently. Uh, and that's where... I, that's what I'm starting to invest in now. So that way, whenever I, I, because I know those opportunities are out there, I'm thinking about it as a composer, oh, this would be a great arpeggio to put in right now, but I can't do it because my fingers won't listen to me. Right. Um, so it's something I, I will actively practice at home now. So that way, in the future, when it happens, I, it'll just happen automatically. Yeah. And not, not, it's not a labored thought. Of like rhythm or whatever, it just happens. But you got the skill down. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that. <laughs> so what is one thing that you wish you could tell aspiring musicians or, or just people who want to learn music at all? I know it's sort of trite. A lot of people say this, but play with players better than you. Find players and play with them and particularly those who elevate your game. Because I find that, you know, I play with a lot of different people. I go out to a lot of uh, different open mics, and I notice a difference. You know, there are certain people that inspire me. There are certain people that uh, really drive me in new directions. And there are other situations where I'm playing with people, it just doesn't click. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think it's important to keep uh, that those diverse experiences to keep you engaged because it's very disheartening when you go out and play with someone and the music's not satisfied and you're not satisfied where you're playing and you feel like you're, you're I've had this happen within the past couple of weeks where I had a I went out to a jam and I was just not happy with my performance and I was doubting my skills and I was doubting that I should uh, you know that the, that, that, that I was worthy to present this to an audience and then the next day I played with another player who I think is more compatible and the music was brilliant. And, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I was, you know, I, I should not have internalized that. 
um, and, and, and blame myself when it was really just the circumstances mm. and, and it wasn't necessarily a reflection on, on, uh, on, on my ability yeah. to be a player. So, you know, I, that, so not only does playing with people better than you help your skills, cause music is an oral tradition and it's only going to be passed down, you know, by listening and emulating. Um, but also too, I think that's uh, playing with different people will, uh, uh, give you an accurate picture of where you stand uh, as a player. Yeah. It, and not only that, but uh, as a pianist, it's, it's hard to fit in. It's hard to fit in with say like a guitar player because the ranges are, are, are similar or yeah. having to fit in with a guitar player and then also a bass player because you can't, you have to lay yeah. off the bass and you have to lay off the middle. Uh, and it's one of the, the things that I've been learning a lot of playing around with like Bjorn Cody and like Robin Chambers and Henry Dvorak. And it, it's, it's where do I fit? Uh, where can I fit a piano in this piece? I, um, and a lot, it's been invaluable. You won't, you don't learn that alone. No, you can't learn that alone. Uh, so that's been a, a wonderful thing. And to your point of playing with people who are better than you or, uh, just playing with other people. Uh, Nathan Arndt is, uh, you, you know Nathan, do you? I think I know who you're talking about, yes. Um, every time I go out and play with him, he he loves to just jam on a piece and let people solo over it. So every single time, he'll, 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 he'll just keep playing and then he, he'll go. It just, this, obviously, the that's single. It. That's it. And uh, to signal that you're, you're doing the solo. And I'm like, I guess I'm not very good at soloing because of my lack of technique. Um, I can do octaves fine, so I'll, I'll, I, that's what I settle with. Right. But most of the time, uh, most of the time, the chord progressions. First off, he's just told me right before the song what the chord progression is, and so some chord progressions are easier than yeah. others because some are more more practiced than others. Uh, so I'm like, but he he just keeps looking at me, and I'm like. Fine, I guess I'll try, <laughs> and it's it's really just pushing me yeah. uh, to to do more. And these are at open mics; these aren't yeah. like gigs, so it's like whatever. Who cares if you mess up? Uh, so that's been a, a a real blessing to play with Nathan and having him to uh, not to force me essentially, but not you know. Now, which open mic is that? Uh, oh, that's uh, Shamrock Cafe. That's I've been meaning to get down there. Now it is the person I know. I I, I know Nathan from yeah. through Bjorn and going to open mics in the past. I want to get down there. I like his playing. Yeah, he's he's awesome. But that's all alternating, right? It's not every week. It's first and third Wednesday. So next Wednesday it, there will be one. All right, uh, that'll be the first. That'll be good because I'm going to be out of town most of Wednesday. I'll be coming home in the evening, so I hope so. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll try to get out to that. Typically goes until like eleven. So yeah, I, I'll probably I won't I won't go the distance just because. Uh, well, I know I got a day gig. I, I sort of take it easy. Uh, I try to get up at you know early and work out. Right. I'm just letting you know just in case if if you might not be able to make it then. Right. Yeah. And don't don't fuss about it. Right. But uh, me don't worry about it. Uh, but yeah, he's awesome. He's pushed me very hard, and and now uh, now I go home feeling a, li- a little disappointed in myself. Not not nothing nothing like awful or anything. Uh, but uh, now I I I'm uh challenged to to work harder at it. So because now because I I don't want to have that same reaction every time he goes, right, and I'm gonna yeah. be like. I don't yeah. want to freeze up every single time. Uh, this past Wednesday, he looked at me and I was ready for him. Uh, and I, 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 I did it. And um, granted, I did it only with the octaves. We, uh, not with, I tried a little bit, but I still need work on that. But it's so much more uh, fun now because I'm expecting the look. And then he looks at me and I give it to him. And he's like, yeah. And it's, it's really fun and encouraging. That's cool. Yeah. So he's a, he's a great dude. Yeah. Well, with all that said, uh, you have a gig coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. I'm Where at? Be, uh, Springgate Arcona in Mechanicsburg. So anybody who wants that, uh, if anyone's over there listening, go check that out. Uh, if you want to make, uh, how long, how far away is that? Uh, it's about fifty minutes. Fifty minutes is a good good hike from from where I am in Lancaster. Yeah. Right. But I mean. Uh, it's it, it's a great place to play. Um, it's in like a mixed use development, so there are homes and apartments and oh. uh, condos and whatnot. And there's commercial and restaurants and 
the Springgate location out there is fairly large, and there's generally a good group of folks that come out. Awesome. Well, if you want to check out any any of his other f- events, go ahead to his website at joesegan.com. That's J-O-E-C-I-G-A-N.com. Did I get it all that right? Yep. I was tripping my mind over that a little bit. Uh, if, if you like this episode, be sure to share. Uh, you can follow us at facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. And you can uh, follow us there. Search that. The story Corey Rose on all streaming platforms. Follow us there if you're just curious about the audio. If you want to know who's coming up next, be sure to check out Facebook. Uh, if you really want to support us, you can message me about merchandise and get a sticker or a hoodie with with the uh, logo on the front and the first 50 guests, including Joe, on the back. With all of that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your night. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at 3.30. We'll have an accordion actor musician called John Milosic. Oh, cool. Uh, he's, a, he's a really cool dude, and I'm excited to talk to him about how he, exactly he got into the accordion. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an interesting one to get into. Awesome. Um, with all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your night, and I will see you guys later. Bye.